It might be because it's Ramadan and uh, I, like everyone else here, is a little bit tired and broken, <laughs> but uh, this is a more personal khutbah than the first one I gave. Uh, it comes from a place of reflection on where I am in my life right now, some of the things I've learned, and what I hope I can share that may be of benefit, especially because I was told this was a khutbah that attracts uh, a younger audience, and so maybe something of what I have to say can be of benefit. A lot of times, as you get older, people ask you, do you have any regrets? And regret is a funny thing because sometimes mistakes you make uh, lead to changes that you needed to make. There was a teacher in Qatar I once met who had a funny saying. He said, life is a very cruel teacher. It gives you the test and then it teaches you the lesson. And so sometimes we work a little backwards. And, and uh, I remember once someone asked me, do you have any regrets? And I was thinking about it and I said, well, I've made my share of mistakes in my life, but I think that out of them, I have seen things about myself, maybe that I didn't like, uh, but that I needed to work on. But there was one mistake I made that I do regret to this day. When I was graduating from high school, many, many years ago, uh, our school put on a cruise. I grew up in New England. They put on a cruise for the graduating seniors. We had a small school. It was like 300 kids. So it was 95 something, less than 90 something seniors in my graduating class way back in 1998. Now you know how old I am. And we went out to Boston Harbor and took a cruise around Boston Harbor from midnight to 4 a.m. or something like that. And it was supposed to be a fun experience uh, for all of us, one last hurrah. And uh, I remember I had made plans to go and, and not told my parents that I had made plans to go and, and they didn't know about it. And uh, I told my parents that evening and they were very surprised. And my mother had planned to take, uh, take me, uh, with my dad of course, for a dinner, a celebration dinner, celebrating my graduation, to a restaurant called Summer's Inn, and this was back when there were not a lot of restaurants, and I grew up in a town with a few thousand people, farm town, so it wasn't really a lot in terms of cuisine. This was the fancy restaurant in the area, and she wanted to take me out for dinner, and for those of you who come from immigrant backgrounds, you know a lot of our parents do not go out to dinner like as a matter of course, right? That is like basically haram, right? So if you suggest it, you should probably maintain a safe distance. So I was really flabbergasted that she wanted to take me to dinner, and then I felt kind of terrible that all my friends were going on this cruise and she wanted to take me to dinner. And in the end, I went on the cruise. And she said, no, no, you should go on the cruise. And, and I, I had a good enough time. But years later, when I look back on it, I think to myself that actually the thing I regret is not going uh, to that dinner with her. And she passed away several years later. Uh, we had a close relationship. She was a, a, a very big influence in my life. And I thought a lot about parenting and what it's like to be on the other side of that equation is when you're younger and you're, you know, you're looking up at your parents and, and then when you're older and, and then suddenly you have a different kind of responsibility. And I thought about my dad and, and a lot of the dads in my community and now that I reflect back on what they did and what they accomplished and this definition of masculinity that they have, it's actually really impressive that they left everything behind, you know, thousands of miles away, and left their family, left their siblings, left their language, their culture, everything, and came here and worked, you know how hard, day in and day out, to provide a better life for their family. And maybe not all of them got the outcome they wanted, but they made these huge sacrifices, day in and day out. And to me, that speaks to a kind of uh, nobility and service and, and strength that unfortunately I think is missing in our culture today. It's really hard to do. It is hard to imagine giving up everything for your family, and yet this was not really that special in the community I grew up in, and, and probably a lot of the communities that you live in. Uh, that We know countless people who made these huge sacrifices for their family, and modeled a kind of quiet, her heroic masculinity, I would say, that is in short supply in, in wider culture, that people tend to look at material indicators and uh, bravado and, and machismo and loud voices and things like that, which ultimately don't amount to much. Uh, nobody wants a dad who, you know, just has a nice car and nothing else to show for it. Uh, maybe they think they do, but they don't. That's not what kids want. That's not what communities need. That's not what partners in life want. They want people who are reliable and strong and sincere and there day in and day out when it's easy and when it's hard. And 
I was thinking about this especially because I, I read a statistic and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago when I was here, mashallah, it was before Ramadan, uh, I, I, uh, I talked about mental health, especially among teenage girls, and, and how much of a crisis it is. And then I saw this article in the New York Times about men. And it, it's pretty sad. A, 21, a 2021 survey of more than 2,000 uh, adults in the United States, less than 50% of men said they were satisfied with how many friends they had. And 15%, right, more than one out of 10, said they had no close friends at all, which is kind of wild. Like, lots of men have no friends. And more than half of men in our country don't have enough friends. And if you think about what that does to a person, it's, it can't be a good thing. And, and of course, this affects women as well. We live in a society that is very connected and yet very alienated and very lonely. And I don't mean this in a judgmental sense. I don't say, like, oh, we're Muslim, we're awesome, everybody else stinks. No, I'm not saying that because probably we're, we live in the same society. If things are great for us, then we have an obligation to share what we have that is good. And if they're not great for us because we live in the same society, we're subject to the same forces, then we should address those things. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what this means and, and how our religion has certain features that guard against this. And, and it's not something that just works, you know, you just you, you implement it as if you take it off a shelf and then suddenly, it, you know, voila, it's there and, and you have it. But in our religion, in our deen, there are certain features that guard against this. And that's what I want to talk about in the second part of the khutbah. But I want to make something very clear. In our faith, our ibadah, our, our adoration, our reverence, our worship of Allah, our creator, right? Which is an, it's not just an obligation, it's what we are created to do. Our accountability before Allah is ours alone, right? That makes sense? We're all judged alone. Nobody's going to be there to answer on your behalf. It's, it's literally each and every one of us by ourselves holding ourselves to account before we are held to account. There's a famous saying of Hadrat Omar, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, the second Khalifa, the second Caliph, that judge yourself before you are judged. And so part of our ibadah is alone, right? One of the, I think for me and, and maybe for a lot of us, the, one of the most beautiful parts of Ramadan is those few times you have maybe late at night when you are alone with your Creator. It's really special. It's hard to, I mean, it's hard to find the time, it's hard to find the energy, it's hard to wake up. But those, those times are really special, and yet, so much of our worship, case in point, here we are, is not like that. We are all together. And I wanted to talk in the second part of the khutbah about why that is, and what that has to do, not just for men, but, but specifically for men, but, but for all Muslims generally, and why that's important, not only to our spiritual, psychological, uh, uh, emotional, and physical well-being, but also our sense of purpose as Muslims. أقول ما تسمعون واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. I say what you hear. I ask forgiveness for myself, for you, and for all those who believe. Seek forgiveness from Allah, for He loves to forgive and forgives most often. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد. All praises due to Allah, uh, the Creator and Sustainer of all that is uh, in existence and can exist. And prayers and peace upon the best of creation, our Teacher, our Example, our Leader, the Prophet Muhammad. Allah says in an authentic Hadith Qudsi. So this is a Hadith that is narrated to us by the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. But they are the words of Allah. So like the Qur'an, it is the words of Allah, but it is not part of the Qur'an. It, it exists alongside the Qur'an. I am as my servant thinks I am. In other words, how we think of Allah is how we will experience Allah. And, and there is, this is one of the reasons why when we reference Allah, when we reference God, when we reference the Divine, we most often reference Him by His quality of Rahmah, mercy, so Rahman, Rahim, almost every chapter of the Qur'an, for example, uh, any action we start, whether you know, apparently large or apparently small, we, sh we should invoke the name of Allah, especially Rahman Rahim. But this does not mean, I want this to be very clear, that we are, we are supposed to get what we want. It does mean 
that Allah wants what is good for us, that by worshiping him, we are doing something that is good for us as we are created. But it doesn't mean that every desire we have should be satisfied. I, you know, I was talking about masculinity earlier. And, and if I ask you among the Sahabi, who is the, who is the man, right? Like, who's that one, who's that one Sahabi who when you say Sahabi, you think, oh my God, right? It's Hazrat Omar, right? May Allah be pleased with him that he had this incredible presence, his physical strength. The a, a story I heard once is that he was getting his hair cut and he said something to the barber, probably, you know, just ordinary directions, but his voice was so deep and loud that the barber fainted, that this was a man's man, right? But, but... Once he heard a recitation of Surah At-Tur about the punishment that Allah has for those who sin and he became so ill out of fear that it applied to him that he could not leave the house for days, right? That he would cry so much that later in his life he had tunnels under his eyes because the tears had eroded his skin, right? That he was constantly afraid that he was in the wrong that his strength was not in the servants of arrogance or pride or anything like that, but of holding himself to account and defending those who could not defend themselves. And so when you look at his life and this, this kind of abstemiousness, this zuhud, this holding back, it speaks to something in our tradition that is very profound and very important, and I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. Uh, the first is that we are made to enjoy exertion. A life where you get everything you want is a miserable one. If anyone here plays sports, maybe you like, um, maybe someone likes studying, I don't know, I was that kid, right? Um, when you work hard, if you ask someone after a difficult basketball game, for example, how do you feel? Physically, they probably feel really tired, but it feels good, right? We are made to want to be pushed. We are not made to sit around and do nothing. That is profoundly unsatisfying. And so religion pushes us because we want to be pushed. Not in a way that is harmful, right? Not in a way that is injurious, but in a way that asks you to go beyond what you think you are capable of. The second thing in our religion is that the religion is meant for this world. It's not meant for some abstract reality that doesn't and can't exist. Right? So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, I am the one who fears Allah the most among you, but I fast and I eat, I pray at night and I sleep, and I marry. Meaning, yes, I am, he's the Prophet, peace be upon him, is saying, yes, I am, the, I am the model of Islam. Of course he is, right? But that doesn't mean he denies himself life in the world. He stays up part of the night to pray, he also sleeps. He fasts, he also eats. He married, he had children, he had grandchildren. Right? He had lives and obligations that went beyond worshipping alone. This is very important to understand. If you go back to that survey that I cited, that so many men are feeling so lonely, and so many Americans feel so lonely, ask yourself what is the value of a tradition that asks us to worship together. Yes, part of our worship is alone, and part of it always should be alone because it's important to, to keep that relationship alive for yourself and make sure you're not doing it to be seen by others. But we have to live in and be part of the world. Yesterday I was here for Tarawih, and it's very similar to the masjid I, I go to in Cincinnati. You're praying Tarawih, and there's like 45,000 children running around at all times, right? They're colliding into you. There's Occasionally I've seen a football fly in the air, right? Nobody knows what's happening, right? Mashallah. And sometimes I've heard a few people say, oh, this is inappropriate. It's disrespectful of the masjid. And I have another way of looking at it and say, isn't it nice to be in a place of life? Would you rather your kids didn't come to the masjid? Would you like to go to a house of worship that is basically full of no one except older people? That has no continuity or hope for the future? And actually it teaches us how to live a life of piety in the world, right? It's very easy to have a focused prayer if you're sitting in your room by yourself late at night. But if you've got sound, someone doesn't realize they've got their like avan ringtone going off in the middle of prayer. Some kids are running around, you're wondering, is that my kid, right? Like these are constant things that are coming at you. That's what Allah is asking us to live a life of faith in the world. Can you remember Allah when you're tired, when you're hungry, when you're tempted by something? It is easy to be pious if there are no challenges. And so we come together over and over again with all our messiness and complexity to see what it's like to live faith in the world. 
right? I prayed Juma a few weeks ago, and mashallah, the brother next to me, he brought his baby in the car seat. Baby was really cute. It was kind of hard to focus on the khutbah because the baby was really cute, right? Baby was just having a great time talking to himself the whole, like the entirety of the khutbah, right? He's just being a baby. And I thought about it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have narrations that in his sajda, his grandchildren, his Hassan and Hussein, may Allah be pleased with them and elevate them in the next life, they would climb on his back and he would stay in sajda until they were done. Which meant even when he's worshipping Allah, he has awareness of who is around him. Because that's the challenge of life of faith. And the second thing is, and, and this is for men especially, and we have all these debates on nature and nurture. I'm not interested in getting into them. I don't even know if you can answer them. But, you know, we'd, I, I'd often hear these questions. Why are men pushed to pray in the masjid and not women? And sometimes men, we give very self-serving, you know, sometimes maybe even misogynistic explanations. But maybe what if it's the opposite? Maybe we're just really bad at socializing, right? Like, we don't know what's good for us. So Allah is saying, no, I'm going to force you to go to the masjid and force you to see other people and force you to talk to other people and force you to stand shoulder to shoulder foot to foot, to be in community with each other. Imagine, I mean, you know, we hear these stories of Omar and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, and all these companions. They must have seen each other thousands of times in their lives at like every salah. Right? Imagine, you, we talk about a society that's lonely. Imagine if you, I mean, obviously it's hard. We don't live in the same kind of society where everything's on a, a human, smaller scale. But even if you went to the masjid a few times a week for prayer, and you see the same people over and over again, you have a sense of nourishment, that part of you is nourished, even as you are worshipping Allah, and why not? Because Allah wants what is good for us, right? He's not going to ask us to do things that ultimately harm us. And so you see someone and then you realize, hey, I haven't seen so-and-so in a few weeks, let me check in and see if he's okay. Or so-and-so looks a little down today, or looks a little different, is he sick? Is he, maybe he's happy about something and wants to share something good. So the challenge I have to you, and especially the young men here, is try to make worship together part of your daily, weekly, monthly routine. Everyone has their own challenges and limitations. Even if you can come outside of Jummah, of course you have to come for Jummah. If you can come to the masjid once a week for a prayer and bring a group of people with you, friends, colleagues, what have you, I mean, Probably they should be Muslim, otherwise it might be a little strange if you just bring them to the masjid. But the point is, have this community together and then check in without your phones, right? You don't need your phones. You need human contact, right? We didn't evolve to look at a screen. We evolved to look at each other, right? This is how Allah created us, right? So be in community with each other. Have these, these experiences together and push and encourage each other because this is something we need. Allah, out of his wisdom, has given us a religion that emphasizes worshiping together because it is a form of strength. It is, it is not easy, and I want to end with that. It is not always easy, it is not going to be easy, but here's the thing. What is on the other side of the effort is beautiful and necessary, but the way Allah has created us, the effort itself is necessary. We find meaning in pushing ourselves. We find meaning in pushing ourselves together. So make that part of your faith, make that part of your experience of faith, and make that part of a sense of community that you have. Because this is what it means to be a Muslim, to live faith in the world. We do not have monasticism. We do not have anyone who disappeared from the world in order to be closer to Allah. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went to Jerusalem, and from Jerusalem ascended to heaven, and stood in the presence of the divine closer than any creation had ever been and is ever allowed to, and then he came back. He came back to finish the work. That's what we do. We have our moments where we have that closeness, and then we go back into the world. That closeness carries us and strengthens us, and then we look forward to the next opportunity.